Thank you for being here. Um, over the past few days, uh, in fact, on July 22nd, a very important meeting took place in India. It was a meeting of the G20 group of nations. And I have not seen the results of that meeting reported widely here in Guyana. But it's important that we keep attuned, ourselves attuned to what's happening globally, particularly when those decisions made elsewhere can have a major impact on our own future. And I believe that those who have not seen the results of that meeting should look at those results. Just to summarize what took place is that they failed, their group, when they met, they failed to re reach consensus on phasing down fossil fuel production. Further, they failed to reach consensus on mobilizing $100 billion per annum for the developing world, a promise that was made since Copenhagen and that was repeated in almost every one of the, the negotiations, the annual negotiations of the country, then it must have a major impact on this global aspiration to net zero. So we have been criticized here by those who believe that the government of Ghana uh, have given up or we have given up on our support for net zero. We have on numerous occasions said and reiterated that we support a net zero target. We fought for that long before we started producing oil and gas. And that target is still essential in our commitment. Secondly, that we are playing a role to, in achieving that target by deploying our forests, which is a huge carbon sink, which makes us a carbon negative country in the global fight against climate change. Thirdly, although we are an oil and gas producer, we will, even at maximum peak production, we will still be a carbon negative, not just a carbon neutral, but a carbon negative country. And we currently support the removal of subsidy on fossil fuel production globally, and we also support a carbon price, which will help to not just penalize the production of fossil fuel, but with incentivize the production of alternative energy. And we support that, either through a cap and trade system or a carbon tax. So our positions are quite clear. And I see in the, the daily um, assessments of the government's, the government's position on climate change, a lot of those or, or that position is not reflected in that assessment. And it comes in the form of letter writing or editorials, which are far off the mark and never placed in the global context. So that's the global context for you. That whilst everyone here or some people here believe that we're not doing enough to abate this global potential global disaster. The countries that matter, that generate most of the emissions, 
they're not making the tough, taking the tough decision. And without them taking the tough decision, because of the sheer volume of emission they have, net, there would be no net zero target. So I hope that in future analyses done here, that people will fit what we are doing here into that global context. And then they would see how enlightened our national position is. And hopefully it will change some of the narrative surrounding this. I'm not very hopeful it will happen because I believe some people have ulterior motives, but I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, so, I've seen uh, uh, in various circles over the past two weeks, my weekly press conference becoming a subject of discussion or debate. And um, I had not intended to address this because I thought it is, it doesn't need addressing. I'm General Secretary of the People's Progressive Party and my position is to defend the policies of this party and the government that it supports. And so defending our position in the light of so much mischaracterization from mainstream media and from social media is something that is necessary. It's not an option, it is necessary. And so, uh, and as long as we have unfair characterization or misrepresentation of our policies, then we will continue to regularly engage the media and those people who by extension, not even through the formal media, but through social media, they look out, they, they, they look out on a weekly basis to get our response to many of these issues that pop up. So I've seen Kaichou News talking about we need a more refined and a different mode of communication rather than these press conferences. And we need to have a to seize a higher ground and demand a more dignified form of information communication. Now, I wish I could say the same thing about Kaichur News in its characterization of what we say. It has ceased to, to have, with the exception of a few um, stories, it has ceased to be a newspaper and more the propaganda arm of presidential aspirants and people who are, in my view, deranged. So let me just use the deranged world. I've descended back into the gutter because I truly deep believe that. So I'm not going to listen to them. Every single week we have had a barrage of criticism of the government and misrepresentation. So, so let me go through quickly a couple of things we have had uh, in the past few weeks. We've seen the leader of the opposition today complain that some people mischaracterize what was posted by Secretary Blinken, that there should be that there should be a constructive opposition in Guyana, and that meant that he was not constructive. So he is he has a big issue about the use of the word constructive, because the U.S. seems to be telling him that you have to now be constructive. You can't be destructive versus constructive. 
So that was the big thing at this press conference, defending that, using one word. Now, these are the same people when the U.S. would put a word called inclusive, will build a whole new theory about the word inclusive in any U.S. statement, saying that it is a criticism of the government of Guyana and that the U.S. is telling us to include the opposition. So this is the duplicity of the APNU for you. Now we have made it clear. We have used the word inclusive in every single one of our documents and our manifesto, long before the U.S. issued these statements. But it just speaks to how sensitive they are, APNU would be, particularly Norton, Tinskin Norton, to say he's been directed by the U.S. now to be constructive. Now that brings me to, to the meeting that they had. First of all, um, there was a Demar Wave story which says opposition leader, U.S. Secretary of State Hall talks. And that's fine. Um, and then it says the Norton Blinken engagement apparently caught the government by surprise according to multiple sources. Far from the truth. The U.S. government communicated to us that they would have a meet and greet a meet and greet at the embassy with the leader of the opposition. Now, clearly, if Norton wants to characterize the meet and greet as holding talks with the Secretary of State, that's his business. That's his business. But. For us, we understood it was a meet and greet. And to support that contention, Norton was there alone. Unlike the government of Ghana, where we held talks with the Secretary of State, we had a full team from our side that engaged the full team from the other side. Mr. Norton himself alone went to the engagement and um, he said that he handed over a dose, dose sir. So now I don't know, we, he should really release this to the public to let us know <coughs> what he actually said to the Secretary of State. But he, Apparently, he told, based on the Demar Wave story, nothing new, that one, one party state in Guyana, two, the discriminating against the, in the award of contracts, starvation of African Guyanese community, politicization of the police force, and a clean voters list. What's new? The U.S. has heard this before. They wrote the, they, they, they wrote the Vice President of the United States maybe a couple of years ago saying the same, exact same thing. So we know, but, but by the way, if, if he's so proud of these talks, I, don't be, I believe that APNU should really pay homage to a, a leader like Norton who has the Secretary of the State of the United States of America uh, um, at his, uh, who can all talks with that. They shouldn't take all the moves now that they are taking now to remove him, replace him. You can't replace a man like that. He's a very valuable asset who has the ear of the Secretary of the State of the United States of America. How dare you do that? This man is playing in really big leagues now. So I would, I hope that the others, Royce Dale Ford and the others, would pay heed to that, that Mr. Norton has the ear of the U.S. Secretary of State and not 
make these attempts, daily attempts to, to have him replaced. But really, it was a non-issue. And no, no, um, I saw a news source said the same thing. We're not blindsided. We knew of it. We knew of it, and we knew what he would actually say at the meeting, because this has been, has been nothing new, absolutely nothing new. And they have been saying this months ago. I've been saying that the race line and all of the corruption line, they can't carry it here with great resonance. So they try to do so internationally. We, we, we've, been, we've been dealing with these matters. So uh, today's, um, today's press conference that the APNU had, I, I'm shocked that Norton would actually defend Patterson. I'm shocked that he would actually defend Patterson in the face of the evidence and say that the police are, they are harassing Patterson. Now there's video evidence to what he did. Everyone has seen this video. It's, it's obscene. It's not like a mistake he went and did it the first time. He came back and, and just as a sense to basically, I don't know what it is, a sense of power or it's just stupidity, but to, to reinforce what he did earlier. Twice he returned to the, to the scene of the crime. And, and it was not offensive to us. It was offensive to the people that he was abusing. They made a report, a complaint against him. What do you expect? That the police, because he's partisan, will not take any action? It's supported by, by vid video evidence. Norton has seen this too. I'm shocked. And to lighten this, that he got a bail to the Nigel Darmlal issue. That uh, it was it, disgusting, totally disgusting. On the Nigel Darmlal issue, we made sure that we allowed the, the police and the, the other agencies of the government to work independently without weighing in at the political level. He is already weighed into this matter in defense of a guy who has clearly broken, broken the law. But he, he said something that is, um, that is very, if we leave it to go unanswered, then it somehow it will get repeated. So he said it is estimated that the PPP spent nine to 12 billion to bribe people at 2023 local government elections. Now, clearly I could say, I could come up with an outrageous figure, but you have to have some sense of decency, not to say that. Where, where could we spend, from which source could we spend nine to $12 billion to bribe people at these elections? But APNU has a way of getting, because people don't scrutinize carefully what they say, they have a way of getting away with all of these, these outrageous comments, and then they get repeated. So I want to take you back, and then Elson Lowe, <coughs> in the same press conference said, corruption and mismanagement is widespread under the PPP. For every $1 spent, we are losing 41 cents, according to the IMF. Now, that's, the IMF has never said anything of this sort. In fact, Norton, uh, uh, Elson Lowe might be talking about for every dollar of donation to APNU, 41 cents get stolen. He might be mistaken this. But he is saying now that we lose 41 cents. 
41% of every of total revenue or spend, uh, expenditure we lose. Now, is this reminiscent of something else? In, 20, in 2015, when APNU was contesting the elections, this is what they had in their manifesto, how they were going to finance the country. And they said, reducing procurement fraud. Estimated by Mr. Anand Gulsaran, the former Auditor General, to be about 28 to 35 percent of total procurement spending of $140 billion. So the estimated procurement fraud was $49 billion of $140 billion. So they were going to stop that and they will have $49 billion because they were supposed to be a clean government with no procurement fraud and $49 billion to spend back on the economy. <clears throat> Clearly, and secondly, they said that tax reforms were expected to yield 12% on a total revenue of $168 billion. So the tax revenue was $135 billion in 2014. By 2019, it was $226 billion. $109 billion, or an 80.7% increase in tax revenue. So despite the fact that they are projecting only $21 billion in increased taxes, and they got eight, $109 billion in more taxes, and they are savings of 49 billion through reduction of procurement fraud. What was the result? They cut the capital expenditure in the five years, every year. So we, we were building less roads, schools, hospitals, etc. They couldn't afford, although they, they got $109 billion more in the five years in tax revenue, which is an 80% increase in tax revenue, they couldn't afford to get the 10,000 school children grant. That was their argument. So we have heard this sort of thing before. We have seen it before. There, Norton is a fossil. Norton cannot think outside, uh, come up with a coherent strategy. And fossils tend to fall back on old documents. So although Clive Thomas's point about giving a million dollars to every person in this country has been disproved a million times before, he now repeats it. He repeats it. He then speaks at their rally and says, the reduction in fraud can help to finance all the wages and salaries, although they didn't po po can't point out where the fraud is taking place, will we'll finance all wages and salaries. They're going back to the past, 2015. And if we're not careful, if we don't expose this, then people may, those who are not familiar with that they did this before, they lied to the people of this country before. They're doing it again. And Norton is so lazy that he does, can't come up with an innovative approach because he wouldn't talk about the plans for oil and gas industry and all of that. By the way, in the report to the Secretary of State, in Gordon Mosley's um, story, he said they discussed the oil and gas sector with um, and their position on the oil and gas with the Secretary of State. The new source story said um, this, not the Damara Wave story, but um, he wouldn't give a clear position up to now, today at the press conference, on his oil and gas strategy, but he will discuss this with the Secretary of State of the United States of America. I'm, I'm wondering what he actually told the Secretary of State, since he said he discussed this with him, and that should be something that we should look at. So I think it is all a soap opera. 
Norton is um, clearly going back to old stuff, stuff that he did from the past, and um, there's there's nothing. I I try to every week to be generous to this gentleman. I try to be generous to him. But week after week, he's demonstrated that he's incapable of being constructive. And I think the external forces see that too, and that's why they said he should be constructive. He, he, he has no skill whatsoever to put together. And the people that he surrounds himself with, this Alson Law, it is, is totally hopeless. So I'm not going to go through anything else from their press conference, because that is all we get from Norton. Every week, people sent it. They want to pay more money to more in wages and salaries. And by the way, Jack Deo said it's not Jack Deo. It's a several students, including students from the University of Guyana. I saw in their public post when he proposed the one million per family, they asked about the Dutch disease, they asked about inflation, they said how affordability. He said, oh, it will not be inflationary if you have the right plan in place. But Jack, the PPP can't put the right plan in place. But he wouldn't say what this plan is if you have the right plan in place. Everyone so he, he just deflects the serious criticism of policy to, to, um, to, generalize, to generalize views. Um, I want to just say one thing about the member of parliament, Vincent Henry. I saw, you know Vincent Henry under the last government he is uh, from Region 9. Under the SLED audit, he was given $165 million to distribute to the indigenous villages in Rupanoni. He was an APNU member of parliament. So this is, he got the money to distribute here. This individual who is now a member of parliament. So he says Amerindians were shut out of final decision on carbon credit sales payment arrangements. It's part of this conspiracy with the Balkans and everyone else, APA and APNU, to kill the, the program for payments for ecosystem services and forest carbon service. So this guy, that's what he wanted. Of the 242 villages that receive money in their bank account, and they receive $4.7 billion in their bank account earlier this year, 220 have already submitted their village plan, which had the approval of their villages to spend their resources. 220 of the 242. The villages were involved, the two shows were involved, and they, are, they already have their money. They, that's $22.5 billion. Of the seven, that's only of the first 150 we received this year, but it's a $750 million sale. They will get $112 million US dollars out of that sale. And if we extrapolate to 2.5 billion, the remaining 70%, these communities will get 375 million US dollars, or nearly 80 billion Guyana dollars to spend in the 242 villages, that they will decide how they spend the money. Vincent Henry and the others can't produce anything, they have no. They can't come up with an initiative that will take money into the communities. In fact, everything they took from the communities, they took away their jobs, reduced their spending in the communities, etc. But they are opposed to a scheme that has delivered already in just a short period 
$4.7 billion in the bank accounts of these villages from that arrangement alone. So this is what we encounter all the time. We, uh, and, and then this gets in the, in the new cycle without the balance being seen and without people knowing who, who he is. Now, I'm, I'm, I've noticed also that um, the, it's a lot, as I said before, some of the mainstream media has been um, writing, carrying letters. The letters are fine. You can't tell people in the country what to write. They can support the government. They can oppose the government. They can be as extraneous, as uh, irrelevant, uninformed as any, anybody in the world. But if the editors believe they lend value to the national conversation, then they get published, and it's a free country. But when the editorials of, of a number of newspapers start taking positions and they believe the positions to be factual uh, when they are not, then it's, it's incumbent upon us that, it's, that we, we, um, we have to, as a party, correct those so that, they, that the government policies do not get, get distorted, as I said, right at the beginning. So the Public Accounts Committee, there's an editorial in the Starbuck New, um, News, which speaks about lots of things. But in that editorial, it says that the Public Accounts Committee has now started working back again because the, a lot of publicity has been brought to the working of the Public Accounts Committee. And I've dealt with that issue here. When Starbuck News wrote an editorial saying that under this government, the P PAC has not been meeting. And we demonstrated, we based on the number of meetings that the PAC had more meetings in the past three years than we had in the entire five years of APNU. We have had more meetings in the past three years. And so that was factually inaccurate. But they continue to say that now it's working, it's meeting, because there's publicity brought it. It was always working. It was always working. Then in the same editorial, it says the functioning of the Public Procurement and Integrity Commission has come under criticism in recent times. It's not just recent times. How could you, the Public, um, the, the Integrity Commission, come under criticism in recent times? This was the first integrity commission that actually published the names comprehensively of all the defaulters in government and in opposition. And that's how we came to know that there are several opposition members of parliament who had not submitted their statements to the integrity commission. So it's not the criticism in recent times, as though it happened under the PPP. They've come under criticism. What about the three years under the APNU, when there was no commission and no submission to the Integrity Commission? If you want to be fair, you have to say that it's functioning better now than under APNU. But this creates the mind, the, the, um, the impression that only in recent times that we have had these, these um, criticisms. It then goes on to speak because Starbuck News had a position on the Sovereign Wealth Fund, regardless of what, because they supported a group 
including the GHRA and the others, that were part of the, the earlier discussion with APNU that allowed them not a single criticism of the Sovereign Wealth Fund when they passed it, when after the no confidence motion on parliament shouldn't have been held. They didn't see anything wrong with that. They didn't see anything wrong with that. They were all party to it, complicit with the illegal government at that time in passing a sovereign wealth fund that placed all the powers to manage the fund in the hands of the Minister of Finance. Totally, absolute power. Although there were some committees like the Investment Committee, the Macroeconomic Committee, the Fiscal Committee, at the end of the day, the Minister of Finance decided how much money will come from the, the fund to the Treasury. It was his call. They didn't see that replacing that with a board of directors now which has specified responsibilities and has to submit a report to the National Assembly. They don't see that as an improvement. Now, all the powers concentrated in the hands of one person and a board of directors now. They had a beef with the president appointing the board of directors, but the president appointed a minister who was political. We have now not a single politician on the, the board, not a single politician to manage this. So, the top heavy bureaucracy for any, so, this some guy named Andrew Bauer said the top heavy bureaucracy for any sovereign wealth fund in the, in the world, he has never seen it as top heavy as ours, right? And um, it's top heavy because they, it's several layers, not because we put in place a stronger team to keep to manage the sovereign wealth fund but APNU had 21 members in the oversight body that we reduced to nine including members of the media to curry favor with them and the GHRA and everybody that is why it was top heavy in the past if it's top heavy now it uh, was even more so under APNU but we have strengthened this fund the Sovereign Wealth Fund and the legislation immeasurably, and the international community has acknowledged that. But if you read this editorial, um, you will believe that we, are, we did something that somehow eroded the independence of this fund or affected it or, or put in greater bureaucracy in its management far from the truth. And, and it's unfortunate that every single time we have to go through this. And in the same editorial, it speaks about di Ali, direct engagement with teachers and different people. So it says that he's undermining institutions. Now, and that in a democracy, you need good institutions. We agree with that. But what about and that the PPP is, is more focused on material things, roads, bridges, schools, etc. But well, we are happy to be focused. And the editorial acknowledges that, these, that people want these things too. So you get elected to deliver on your promises. And parties promise higher wages and salaries. They promise better pension. They promise they help the school kids, they promise more roads, cheaper power, and they have to deliver that. They have to deliver on those promises. We take those promises seriously. So what we can't be accused of is undermining. We may have a different position than the teachers union and talk directly to some teachers because those teachers feel excluded too. Like a lot of them have come and complained to us that when we had given, since when I was president, we gave 100 vehicles 
per year to the teachers' union, duty-free concessions, and we asked the teachers' union to, to decide who gets it, that they were being discriminated against, that friends and families and politically connected people were all getting it, and hard-working teachers could not get the duty-free concession. The union was using it to build their own credibility, the leaders, and to, in a corrupt manner, giving it to pe some people. The teachers come and complain to us too. Should we ignore those teachers? Should we ignore them that their union excludes them from lots of activities? Or that they're concerned that the union is becoming more political and not addressing their concerns? Well, that's not the nature of the government or President Ali. He will engage people. It's not undermining institutions. It's being accessible to people. We had a situation where the last government was totally inaccessible to, to people, from the ministers all the way up to the president. He was a rarity in national uh, life. There, you could hardly ever see him. Uh, occasionally, he would appear in a public engagement, and people would not even get to approach him. We have a different president now. Who is more open to that? It's not undermining institutions. And oh, the president has to go through some elected leader at the local government level. We're, we're in a world that happens. If the president wants to go into to Mecca and talk to people about building roads, which is the government's responsibility in Mecca, he has to get the approval from the chairman of the the area, an ordinary citizen can go into the community and talk about anything, buy a piece of land, establish a house, and the president must get the approval. It's all nonsense. And that, that kind of thing is undermining in the editorial, the, the um, institutions. What about APNU undermining our constitution when they refuse to abide by it in a no-confidence motion. What about APNU um, violating the Constitution when they unilaterally, when Granger unilaterally appointed the chairman of the Elections Commission? Those are the key issues because their importance, these, these are the important institutions that we have to preserve the separation of power. You, when the attorney general of the past would openly say to judges in the court that he doesn't, well, basically threaten them. I have two instances. When the president called over the head of the commission and one of the public service commission and said, if you don't resign, an independent commission, you don't resign, I don't want blood on my carpet. You ask Carvel Duncan about it. Those are the things that undermine a country's institution. Not when the president meets with the teachers or, or when he goes into an NDC to help people. So these things have a way of getting blown out of proportion and mischaracterize. When people come, they expect a ton of them come to Freedom House or, or the office of the president. Should we say to them, if it's a teacher, go back and go, don't come here, go back and come, come through the, your union. When somebody comes there for something, should we not see them? Because, oh, that's vi violating protocol, the president, the Prime Minister must not meet with people first. It must go through a particular system. That's not the kind of government we want to have. We'll never have in the PVP. It would be an involved government, and it allows us to keep our ears close to people on the ground. So I, I particularly wanted to talk a bit about that, because we've seen a lot of this. And when we defend ourselves, suddenly it's an abuse of the media. But our it is, um, you know, mischaracterizing, it's undignified. It is not because these are these 
editorials, if they're accurate and we're criticized fairly, we have to live with the criticism. We'd have to live with the criticism because it's factual. But when, when it seeks to portray our party and the government in a particular manner, who but we must defend this? Starbuck News or Kaichur News or the others will not defend this. We have to do so. And so these are just some of the things that I, I wanted to talk a bit about today. Um, there, are lots of, there are lots of issues there, but at a subsequent press conference, I'll deal with those. But these are some of the things. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I've spoken about COP, the, the next COP here, and my fear that the same issue that characterized this, the G20 meeting, the same issue will, will take place there, where you have a confrontation between those who believe that you don't need to face down fossil fuel production at this stage because there is a global demand for fossil fuel and it's growing. And those who believe that you have to, to not just face it down, but face it out. And that is why if, if that continues and that debate is taken to the next COP in that manner, it will fail. It will fail. We are trying, and the President's speech will reflect this at COP, the next COP. We are trying to say that there are several things that have to be done simultaneously. So we don't need to face down fossil fuel production, but simultaneously, we need to incentivize the production of renewable. So we have to move faster to a carbon price globally. Secondly, we cannot discard technology and future technology as part of the solution. Some of the climate activists don't want to hear about carbon capture and storage. They don't want to hear about direct schemes to direct, ex directly extract CO2 out of the atmosphere. You cannot take that hardline position. You know, there is a role for technology in the future. So it's a combination of re reducing fossil fuel production, increasing the output of renewable, and then addressing and forests, addressing forests, deforestation. Uh, the, these are under new technology. If we go in with that mindset, let's explore the broad spectrum of solutions. I think we can come out with some agreement from the next COP. But if it goes in the same manner, it will be a failure. And then clearly, the developing world. We said this to UAE, the minister, that people are not going to walk away from this issue with the developing world not fulfilling its basic promise, which is the $100 billion per year. 
they they have all of these fancy accounting now to show that they're they're doing almost 75 percent of it 75 billion dollars but when you check it really a lot of it more majority of it is loans to countries that cannot afford because their fiscal interests cannot afford to take more loans so that issue has to be resolved we I, put, I raised this in the discussion with Secretary of State Blinken at, at the State House. I said it's not just the funding, but addressing the institutions that intermediate the funds, the funds, because a lot of them are not fit for purpose, and the slope between the availability of funds and their del delivery is is unbelievable. So I believe that COP, the next COP, will, it's right now from what I see, I'm not very optimistic, but we are going there to try to push, hopefully, to get it along to make, ensure that you have a, a bigger search outside of shutting down versus continuation. Um, that there's a bigger sort of solution with more, with more ideas on the table. And the other part is, oh, the advantage. So, so we've been saying all along that it's unreasonable to expect Guyana to limit its production when the entire world is not just and especially the developed world, they're refusing to cut their production. In fact, they're increasing their output of fossil fuel. And it's therefore we, in this case, and, and they're the ones who have used up most of their carbon allowance. If you look at historically, the the emission levels historically, you would see they have practically used up all their carbon allowance. So if there is, the world will continue to need fossil fuel into the future. And especially in a net zero scenario, then the fossil fuel of the future should come from countries that need, need the production to enhance not just the welfare of their people, but also to fund their adaptation needs, that this should come from the developing world. And that, is, that has been our argument all along, that it must come from the developing world. And when the Secretary General of the United Nations says, no new investment in fossil fuel, he is effectively saying, preserve not just the entire future of all fossil fuel production for the existing countries, Norway, Russia, the United States, Saudi Arabia, but also preserve future growth of fossil fuel output for those countries. So nothing for you in the developing world. You should not get, you should block all the financing to develop any of these facilities, etc. And we find that essentially unjust and unfair to the many developing countries in Africa, here in this region, many other parts of the world, who are trying to take their people out of poverty. Just to follow up, uh, yeah, sure. Yes. And I'm not saying that you know that's not acceptable, but when you look at the effort and how quickly that occurred, do you think that represents a disrespect for the developing countries who are facing the brunt of climate change and you constantly have to yeah. over the, the, the this this is an argument we have been making from several perspectives. So one, the way that the sum of money mobilized for Ukraine. Now, we don't begrudge Ukraine and the money that they get, and they may deserve it, but we're, 
we're painfully aware that existential threats like the one, the climate one, have been languishing for lack of funding in the particularly the adaptation measures in many developing countries have been languishing for lack of funding because of the reluctance of the developed world to, to assist, which they committed to in the Kyoto Protocol. And um, so that's one, it's, it's a duplicitous position. Secondly, we have seen how refugees are treated from Ukraine into Europe versus refugees from Africa that have gone into Europe. They're treated with two different standards. So it's not just on the funding side, it's on these, the treatment of people. And that is why we, we have seen also with the entire Europe and the others championing the US, especially the Biden administration, championing initially the need to cut fossil fuel production and to ban loans and grants into any infrastructure for fossil fuel production. When the threat of higher prices affected those economies, that all of these commitments were cast aside and they started aggressively to build and to, to start to build infrastructure relating to fossil fuel um, production or transportation and they fired back many of the, the coal power plants. The coal fired power plants were, were reopened I recall the United Kingdom itself leading a charge in the COP at Glasgow to ban coal product, um, as, a, as a fuel for the production of energy. And now that country has several, reopened several of its coal fire power plants. So they, these countries operate on the basis of what is good for them and what is in the best interest of their people and their economies. And when we, we try to do that in countries like ours, in a fair, just system, we try to do what's best for our country and our people. We, we have the lectures from these specialists from abroad telling us what we must do. And then we have a slew of people here in this country itself who believe we must act in the best interests of other people in the world when they're not acting in their own best interests, long-term best interests I'm speaking about. So, so it's often a difficult policy making environment for people now and that's why constantly all the time you have to be at this over and over in a repetitive way stating and restating your positions lest they get misrepresented. Okay, so on that, the, the, the Natural Resources Fund Act provides for an opposition nominee on the oversight body. And um, they, they should be there because that body has an important role to play. Ultimately, I think they're figuring out because on many matters, they would not live up to their responsibility of a constructive opposition to give their comments 
on bills. We've gone through that before. They're saying, oh, Parliament, let's wait until Parliament. We're tabling, we're tabling um, the Petroleum Activities Bill on the 3rd, I think, of August. So let's see what, what amendment they will propose there because they said, um, they said they will give their comments on the floor of Parliament. We've been trying to get them to give comments before so we can incorporate or assess whether their comments would add value to the, to the draft before we table it in Parliament. So they, they've chosen a, an approach to stay on the sideline and shout rather than to be part of the engagement where they can exercise true oversight. But there are several safeguards, regardless of whether they are there or not. There are two reports that have to go to the National Assembly for debate. And so whether they are part of the bill or not, I think they will get a chance to have their say in the National Assembly when those reports go on, on the use of the funds and this, the state of the funds. They were the state of the funds. Um, the Chinese landing issue. Um, I just want to remind people, uh, lest we forget, that this matter was adjudicated at the Caribbean Court of Justice. that the Guyana Geology and Mines Commission had issued a cease order against this miner. That the mining permits were given to this company before the Amerindian Act was passed, before the lands were titled in this area. So when GGMC issued a cease order saying that the miner was not in compliance with the Amerindian Act and they had to give the village at least 10% royalty the company took us to court, GGMC, saying that the cease order was illegal. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. This went all the way to the Caribbean Court of Justice, and the Caribbean Court of Justice lifted the cease order. So we had stopped mining in this village effectively, saying, you have to comply with the Amerindian Act. That was the government's position. The Caribbean Court of Justice, the apex court, has ruled against us. And so we had to lift the sea sword. So since then, I believe too, I spoke with the two show last year, and at the at the National Tushaus Council, um, the conference we had with Tushaus. And he said to us that you had a lot of illegal mining taking place in the area, that people sometimes are forewarned because when GGMC would go in there, they move their equipment, they stop, like they, they have notice before, so we undertook to try to address some of these issues because we had to be respectful of the CCJ decision to, to see if you can do on the spot raids, etc. I spoke with the GGMC. They told me the matter is complicated. Some People in the village support the, the mining company, and others don't. We have now given the Tushau and the others permission to mine. 
So the village itself is doing mining in the area. You have a number of illegal mines that they say that are not even related to the company that carried us to court. We intend to respect the ruling of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. So we are going to once again send in another team to visit the area. And that would be a multifaceted team dealing with environment, social issues, um, mining rights, every, everything, to meet with the community and then prepare a report, which we will then submit to the, to the IACHR. So that is where we are at this time. We have, we have noted the, the ruling. We ourselves are very concerned. The community is our primary concern, and we, we believe that any, any, um, any transgressions there of a social, environmental, mining nature should be penalized heavily. We share that view. But it's very complicated because um, you have a number of people every time the two show and others come and speak to us. You have another group from the village that will come and say they don't agree with it. They support the minor and all sorts of things we're getting. So hopefully one meeting in the whole village can, can help to solve this issue. Let's see how it goes. But let us be clear on this matter. It was the government of Guyana that took the side of the community, and we got the, and the Caribbean Court of Justice ruled against us, and we had to lift the, the cease order. I think there is another cease order against the company, but this time for mining violations. Yes, Dennis. Every, everything. It has to be a comprehensive report, so we will ensure that the team has representatives from every sector that will go and have a full-fledged discussion with the villagers and meet the people here. First, so first we have to get a report to identify the sources of the threat, whether they are real or not, or just, so because you have to examine that too. I, there are a lot of public relations surrounding some aspects of, of this issue that I don't agree with, but I don't want to venture that opinion. We need to, to check it on the ground first. And so address the real concerns, the real issues, and separate out those from the fiction. It might be helpful. I wonder if we may be able to get but a small media group to go into, because we have nothing to, be, to hide here. We have nothing. But if we pick one, you know how we, we get criticized. We can't ca carry everyone in. So, and then you get criticized, you're being selective that you're picking people from like one question. You know, the president got criticized for that and Blinken. So let's think about it, but I will talk to Gail to see if we can come up with maybe an agreement with, with people here or whether we can take in a couple of media people too. All right. Black Sea, okay. Uh, are some prepared to subsidize uh, the price of flour? Uh, the price is sold beyond the thing that we will need in the market? Okay, the wheat prices have gone up, but I saw the local flour mill saying that it will not affect them. I think I read a report to that effect. 
in the local newspapers. So if it will not affect them, then we don't anticipate any increase here in the price because I think they have their own procurement. They're linked to a bigger company in the U.S. and they, they buy into the future. So I'll have to examine that. See, Google someone, uh, Namelco, Namelco, and see if I'm accurate there. Namelco says that. Hmm? Yes, yes, this might have been about a week ago I read something, right? Is it accurate? Um, uh, what date was it? Last week, last week. Yes, we, we are too. Then it's anything. And, and one thing I see, um, like the cost of living issue, it has it's received so much prominence in the Starbuck News that I think it, it has become a campaign now. They have 31 part series, 31 series, getting, saying the same things. Now the cost of living has skyrocketed in Trinidad and Tobago. It has skyrocketed in Venezuela, in Suriname, unbelievable, unbelievably, in the US, etc. So cost of living increases have been observed throughout the world, higher than in Guyana. So if you go to a man and ask him, has there been a cost of living increase? He'll say yes. But the government, the, what the editorial does not do to say, are you aware, or not the editorial, these interviews, are you aware that throughout the increase in prices for fuel, when the price skyrocketed for fuel, that the government did not increase the price of electricity. Electricity is a huge component of cost of living, electricity prices. Two, are you aware that the government did not increase the price for, the, um, for water? Because the government provides water. We kept water and electricity prices constant. What this meant, you don't see it, but bigger subventions to these agencies, they're in subsidy. We subsidize those. So two huge components of costs we observe as part of the government plan to abate the cost of living increases. Thirdly, we then reduce in the period when freight had gone crazy from three, five to $20,000 per container to ship from China. We still use the 3,005 rate for the purpose of calculating the taxes because you know the taxes are levied on costs, insurance, and freight. So if you had used the freight to 20,000 now, it meant a bigger base to levy the ad valorem tax. So we did that too. We then had direct interventions. We remove the taxes on a whole range of items, data, on data, on electricity, on water, on food items, a whole range of stuff, all the value-added taxes. So we had a significant number of interventions with people who were building low-income houses, we're giving them free steel and cement. Ask what the other countries have done in that regard. You've seen in Suriname a massive increase in electricity prices. You had street protests, all of that. So with the Starbuck News should at least say to people what's being done to abate the cost of living and the interventionist approach we've had here with the government of Ghana. But it's always a concern, Dennis, anytime prices go up, especially those. We, one stage we had oil, cooking oil at triple the, co the cost for cooking oil, triple its price in the local market. That is when the big countries stop exporting. Indonesia, Malaysia, they stop exporting cooking oil and they were, they were bulk, bulk exporters of cooking oil. Now it has abated a bit, it's come down a bit. So, so yes, it's a big concern. Norton is right in one thing, that we have not spent the $5 billion that we set aside this year 
to on cost of living measure for assistance on cost of living measures as yet. We have not spent. No, we have not spent. So we will we look at it, we'll see where the interventions are needed. We said we need to consult with people and then we'll do it. I don't, um, I don't, it may have received, yes, I think may have received, but it, I don't think it is any different or on any scale that is different than anyone else. But, um, but I, don't, I don't collect the money as general secretary of the party. You, when you make a f payments to Freedom House, you come, if you were giving and you collect your receipt. You don't pay it to the general secretary. But big big sums or bigger sums will come to me. And I don't I've never heard the Mohammed name mentioned in a bigger sum. I don't um, advocate what? No, as I said before, it's, it's a question. Right now, we're not soliciting funds from anyone. We're not soliciting funds from anyone. The, if the, anybody, let me make it clear. So if anyone donates to the PPP with the hope that they can do, and I'm not saying this about the Mohammeds, I'm speaking about anyone, with the hope that they can do something illegal and then bypass the system or get, get a free pass, they're sadly mistaken. So let me just say that. So I don't see any donation that comes into the PPP um, as linked to anything that is done at the government level or it doesn't give you a free pass. That, that's my position on these matters. That is why often it remains at that level, at the level of the party and the secretaries. I'll, I'll decide at that, at that time. I don't want to get caught up because with your headlines. I don't want to get caught up with your headlines because the headlines often Jack Deo refuses funds from the mom. I mean, you can, you, when, when we're notified, then that presupposes guilt on their part. That presupposes guilt on their part. Uh, right now, we have not been officially notified by the U.S. government that the Mohammeds are involved in anything. I told you when that we have a Reuters story we can operate on the basis of a story. But if we receive that notification, or then everything else follows. Everything else follows. But we have not asked the Mohammed for any money. Um, we have not asked them for any money. And we don't expect them to give us any money. And even if they had given money in the past, it's not. Um, it's not of a magnitude that is different than many others, ordinary people. And two, it doesn't buy them special privileges from the PPP government or the party. Oh, Huawei, Huawei, um, Huawei as we had discussions with the U.S. government a long time back when Secretary of State Pompey was here, and they expressed concerns about Huawei. Um, but the thing is that a number of countries in the world are using Huawei's equipment. Many countries in the developed world are using Huawei's equipment. 
I think they may have concerns about. The key, key where the interface takes place with U.S. fibers, not so much the equipment, because from what I gather, even from the private people who are making investments now, that the equipment are significantly cheaper than equipment from Western sources. And if you're in the private sector, many people are using Huawei equipment. Where it may have a contention is where you interconnect with the cable. That if Huawei inter Air equipment is used to interface with a U.S. a cable that terminates in the U.S. a fiber optic cable in the U.S. Then there would be major concerns there. The government of Guyana has no such cable, and so we are. Most of our focus has been with Huawei so far on putting up infrastructure like the. The smart city program, we're now expanding that to smart, a smart country program. So it will be more the cameras, the infrastructure, the fiber, the switching gear, all of that for domestic use. We don't have much for the U.S. to spy on us with or, or China. I don't think we have nuclear weapons and all of those things for, for us to be a major they just have to go down to the Bamba Mali and you get all that happens in the government or in the opposition. So you don't need sophisticated, um, you don't need sophisticated equipment in this country or, or Starbuck Market Square. Everybody knows everybody's business in this country. So that's not a concern of ours in, internally. But where it interfaces with US, I guess they may have concerns. And we will address the U.S. concerns too, because we live in the Western Hemisphere, and we a lot of our business has to be done in that regard with the U.S. And almost all of our cables end up in the U.S., so we have to pay, pay attention to their concerns. But Huawei, Huawei has been here all along, and I guess they'll be um, they'll be doing more. In fact, they're now building out even as I speak long before the president um, visit we are expanding the smart city program to to region six and and three these are the most popular so it's four three and six these are the three most populous regions in the country they are putting in the they have a contract to put in the the um, fiber not the fiber, the, the cameras, etc. And we're now moving parallel with that on the biometrics, um, the biometrics program. On the third, you will have a piece of legislation table in parliament to allow the, the new the electronic base ID card to come into place, not to replace the one issued by GCOM, but this one would have the people's biometrics, which could be used for by the security services for enhanced security in our country. So I don't, I don't, um, I don't see us having too much conflict with the U.S. because many, many U.S. allies in the world are using um, Huawei equipment internally, and their the equipment is good. It's good equipment from what I've spoken to a number of people in the private sector who are buying the, this equipment, and it's co very, very competitive. And I heard you get a lot of, like, the subsequent service from the, if they, they would have a presence here. Okay, 
to be to be um, frank, I have not had a chance to meet with them again. I've been extremely busy, and so once I guess they're still finding their way, but we'll be meeting with them shortly. So I've not had a chance to have a feedback as yet in many from many of those areas. Um, I guess the president has to appoint the mayors and deputy mayors soon, and so uh, then those councils could be fully functional, especially in the towns. Yes. Yes, because we anticipate that the legislation will be passed before the recess. So we'd have a finalized um, PSA and also the new petroleum activities law, which, would, um, which were the two preconditions that we set ourselves before we conclude the bid round. So both would be ready and I will give enough time to the potential bidders to submit their bid. That's why I think it's the 10th of September we discuss. I also had a discussion based on Marcel, what Marcel raised the last time about the, with, with Vic and the commissioner about the audits. I told them they got to move swiftly and wrap this up. The commissioner indicated that he believes that they can wrap up the old audit very soon and make se serious progress on, on the new one. They've been having, he's been having some discussions with, with the, the auditors. So, because those, the GRA, GRA, Mr. Station. So we, because that was one um, commitment I made at the last press conference to Marcel, who was here, that I'll get them to call her, but I only managed yesterday to speak with them about the audits. Yes. No, no, no. In fact, in fact, uh, I think we have had two or three more persons um, who have approached us saying that they would be interested. But of course, they have to go into the data room, buy the package, and then see whether they would actually make a bid. So we're a number of people have expressed interest. Whether they will finally put in a submission, because as you know, they have to put in it's a large sum of money they'd have to find if they succeed to pay the, through the signing bonus. So let's see how that goes. Oh, they've asked, they've asked for us to rebuild a shed there. Um, we're looking to acquire some land there, but it's very difficult in charity. So I, I actually flew over the area and um, on the way to Maruka, and then I asked Minister Colin Kroll, because we're building a new housing scheme, whether he could get about 15 acres of land adjoining the new scheme, where we can develop for commercial purposes, because ultimately they need maybe a high-end market and shopping malls and things like those. And charity, all the lands are taken. It's very tight. So even if you look at the part that's burnt out, it would not facilitate the growth of a modern market. It's a narrow strip of land, less than a quarter of an acre of land. So whilst there may be a commitment to rebuild a shed there, I spoke with the people, some of the vendors, and I said, we should do something major now. Let's shift to a market of the future with, you know, maybe modern facilities, parking, and everything else for, for the area. So we are looking to see if we can identify about 15 acres there that would allow us to do that, like leave out plots for, you know, commercial, commercial growth in the area, in that. In charity, it is just, yes, um, closer to the, I think, this 
the northern northern side as you go closer to the mouth of the river. I, I spoke with one gentleman who had 15 acres of, or 17 acres of land there and he wanted to sell, but I told the regional chair to follow up with him, but I don't know what's happening. But apparently that's very far away and you don't want to take people too far away from the center too. So we'd have to examine all of that and con of course consult with the people in the area. Because if they don't want to move, then no use, you, try you move the market there. We've had that experience before. You move the market, but the people don't wanna, want to move. So we are, we'd have to do more consultations in that, that area. Yes, yes please. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right, let me get this young lady first and then. I can't, I can't hear you a bit more. Oh, we discussed this at um, our last central committee meeting. And there are two options we came up with, which the next central committee will form. It's either towards the end of the year or early next year. So the last central committee meeting, which was a few weeks ago, we discussed this. You know, I dealt with that extensively. That's why I did not want to um, go back on the debt issue. Remember last week I dealt with it that the debt is notwithstanding all of this. The debt is just now 22% of GDP, down from 900% of GDP, then 45% in 2015. Now it's 22% of GDP from using 100% of revenue to service debt. It's about 7% of revenue. So that when you look at the size of our economy, that's what 150 million represents. Yeah, but, but the former Auditor General is no authority. I just told you that he had said that we were losing $35 billion, 35% of total procurement, or $49 billion per annum through fraud in 2015 when he was close to APNO. So I asked him to come. I invited him once to come to a conference when we're in opposition to tell the people of the country and to tell us because we're interested in knowing in opposition we what where this money was so tell us only about one billion of fraud not 49 since he calculated it at 49 billion just give us a 1 billion of the 49 billion he said we are losing out of fraud he never he disappeared never showed up but he's not an economist so that's the problem and remember one time we, we, he said that the central bank had a lot of money in the bank accounts so we could pay wages and salaries D doesn't understand the economic framework it's not an accounting framework accountants treat money differently than economists so he doesn't understand things like uh, the, the, monetary the monetary and fiscal policy could cause inflation and a, and, and a whole range of stuff. So I don't pay attention to him. He is, you know, he, um, after I said that recently that he was, I said something about him, akin to that he was, he was duplicitous. And he wrote me a letter from Ramjatan saying he will sue me. And we responded, we responded to say to him, go ahead um, and I'll share with you the letter that we responded, which actually showed that everything that I said was accurate about him when he was, oh, I said that he has no credibility whatsoever. 
that he was in the audit office in the new period when for 10 years there was no audited accounts for the country. Now, the sole job of the Auditor General at that time, that was before we extended their right to audit public corporations, which we did when I, when I was Minister of Finance. So they only were auditing the public accounts, that is central government expenditure. This office sat down for 10 years and didn't do any work because they didn't produce an audited report. And he was the, one, the, the Deputy Auditor General and then Auditor General. Anyone who had integrity would have said, I can't work with this government because I'm collecting money and I'm not doing anything. I'm not co collecting money, I'm not doing any work. And therefore would have resigned if he was so interested in accountability. So that you can, you can understand where I'm coming from when he says this sort of thing. That he has just been, and, and then again this issue about 40, which, which Apnu quoted him, 49 billion in procurement fraud. But you couldn't demonstrate 1 billion. And he didn't say a word when, in the whole five years period, or he just, he just spoke about it in passing. So don't worry about him, about that framework and all of that. You heard what I said, the, how it is managed and where the money is invested. So he is no authority for me. And if he wants to sue me because of the comments I made, which I made the last time, feel free to, to go ahead and, and file a lawsuit because I'm going to insist that in the, that period, he had no integrity. He had to show where, where any work that he did in the period, the work that he did. Yeah, well, from the time when a discovery is made, you have to do a not go through a number of steps in ascertaining the this the quantity. And so, for me, it's not a priority. I know these this the, frankly speaking, whether it's it's eleven, it will happen. It's just a matter of time. So I suspect at this point in time they're going through. It's in their interest, Exxon's interest to show bigger reserves too. It does affect them globally, their company that traded on the exchange too. But they have to go through a technical process. I suspect that's all that's happening now. It's the same with Suriname. Suriname has made some discoveries, but you'd never hear about X billion or billions of barrels of proven reserves as as of now, there's still, I forgot what they call it, the proving wells or something, the proving of the resources. They have to go through that process. So I suspect that's here. I heard you're approaching again, Glenn Lyle is right. You put somebody from the state sector now, oil, oil now? No, uh, no. Glenn Lyle said they're stealing all of his staff from there. <laughs> You asking me questions, you should ask CJX first of all, are you gonna move to the next stage? Because 
they claim they've made discoveries, but everything is in their court as to whether they want to move to production. Then they have to approach us. I must say, at this point in time, in spite of the discoveries, they have not approached us to say we want to now to start producing a produ production license. Gini uh, coefficient, the co Gini coefficient. Yes. Yeah, so, so this whole approach, um, it is also about not just inequality. It, it, often, it's difficult to estimate inequality when, when there are qualitative parameters involved, not just quantitative. So for example, a, an indigenous community that operates more on subsistence, you might miss a lot of the the income, for example, on electricity. Say the income, their, their expenditure on electricity, or the income they earn. But the government, on the other hand, will provide 35,000 panels, solar panels, for each home there in that area. That's an additional, that is a, an income in that you should really be add, add back to, to income, normal income, like earn from, from a job, et cetera, because they don't have to do that. So I don't think they, we have firm numbers on that income inequality at this point in time. I'll, I'll be frank with you, because everything done by all the international community etc they're all estimates for us we we um, we use some proxies so access to basic needs are important for us and that is how we're trying to reduce poverty not just from an income or expenditure perspective but access to basic needs because that covers everyone so health, health services, and the state provision of health services, the state provision of educational opportunities, widespread, scholarships, etc. How housing is another issue that we are looking at, more provision of houses. So from the time you, a person now gets a plot of land, they get a house they start climbing in, in terms of access to basic needs. A number of other similar areas that we, we look at, water, water is another one, the provision of water. So although a community may not get higher income, say an indigenous community, but right now we provide free water to that community. So we've been looking at to try to reduce poverty gaps, and uh, we have been addressing a number of the basic need ap approach. S then special programs to raise incomes. The part-time job, you've seen that a lot of people criticize. We now, in I, again, I want to use the Amerindian communities because they are mainly in the informal sector and distant from the coast. We have had 2,500 CSOs hired and another 2,000 persons part-time jobs. That's 4,500 persons now hired in the, last, in the last three years in these communities. They, they, 
annual income to these people will exceed over $2 billion. These are direct income levels. And so, so if you look at, look at that, but if you, if you look at like data, the data here in Guyana, even with the census that we just had, is not, um, the data is in not a tip-top shape. And so I've seen, I've seen a lot of debates in the media about the quality of data. The people are right, absolutely right, that the data here is not um, of the quality that we, we would like to see. Yeah. Yeah, so, so when we got into office in 92, I have to take you back. PM, was, PM Hines was in charge at that time of the mining sector. And we contracted PricewaterhouseCoopers to review our mining regime, our mining regime, and where we were globally in terms of gold production in terms of competitiveness. And they did a report, and that, based on that report, we established the mining regime. Since then, we've had stability in that regime. We've not changed it much, with the exception of like 20, I think 2010, 2011, just before I left, that when the prices of gold, the price of gold actually went beyond $1,000 per ounce of gold. We said that for the large companies, the royalty rate will move from 5% to 8% when the price of gold exceeds $1,000 and below, below $1,000 it would remain at the, at the old price. So our regime has not changed. Our fiscal regime in the gold mining sector has not changed in 20 odd years. It's been, it remained the same, but it was based on that PricewaterhouseCoopers study of global mining regimes and the competitiveness of those regimes. So, when you have to understand, when an Exxon goes to its shareholders or to raise capital, they have to raise capital to invest here. They can't come and say, we have an unfavorable environment in Guyana, therefore give me money to invest in Guyana. So everyone does a marketing job too. You, you understand? They wouldn't say that. Only a madman would say that. Okay. Thank you very much.